Hey, what's going on everyone? So thrilled to have you join us today. My name is Emery and I wanna welcome you to Manor Church. Today we are diving into part four of our current sermon series, Hypocrite. Now later during this experience, we'll have a time where we will take communion together. And if you've asked Jesus to be the Lord and savior of your life, I invite you to participate. You don't need to have this special wafer and grape juice combo. All you need to have is something to drink and something to eat. But first, let's prepare our hearts as man of worship leads us in worship through song.
Well, welcome back. As I mentioned earlier, we're taking communion together during our experience. If you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I want to invite you to participate in communion. Go ahead and grab those elements as we prepare. When Jesus was with us, he left us with some traditions. We call them sacraments. Jesus said, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I give for the life of the world. Communion is a reminder of our intimate connection and ongoing relationship with Jesus. On the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and when he gave thanks, he broke it and he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So whatever element you have as your bread to represent his body, take it and eat it at this time. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. You may drink at this time. 1 Corinthians 11 says, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your body that was broken. We thank you for your blood that was shed for the sins of man. Thank you for dying a death that we should have died and standing in our place, making us right with God. Lord, we glorify you. We lift your name high. We love you. We trust you in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. I love when we get the opportunity to take communion together. It just reorients our hearts to remember the finished work that Jesus did for us on the cross. Well, welcome, Man of Church. I would like to welcome those of you all who may be joining us for the very first time here in Manor Online. If that's you, we thank you so much for being our guest. There's a simple way to let us know that you were here with us. I invite you to text the word guest to the number that you see on your screen right now. Go ahead and pause this if you need to. If you're watching this on the website, manna.church, you can either text or you can click the button under this screen that says first time guest. Now, you may have been watching Manna online for quite some time, but you haven't let us know that you're here yet. It's all good. If that's you, we really would like to hear from you, though. I invite you to go ahead and text the word guest to the number that you see on your screen as well. We have a team that wants to connect with you, see how we can serve you in weeks to come and get you connected. Thank you again for joining us, and we hope you join us again here very soon. At this time, I want to invite you to participate in worship through giving. We give of our finances to the Lord as a way to demonstrate to him that we're putting him first and that we're following his ways. If you currently give online through the web or through the app, please continue to do so. But if you would like to give today online, you can give via PayPal by simply texting the word MANA to the number that you see on your screen. If you'd like to write a check, make it out to Manor Church. You can also mail it in or you can drop it off at our Cliffdale site here in the Fayetteville, Fort Liberty region. That address is 5117 Cliffdale Road, Fayetteville, North Carolina, 28314. If you're our guest today, please feel no obligation to give financially. Let's pray now over the offering. Father, we thank you for the offering that's given. We ask that you bless it, that you multiply it for the furthering of your kingdom here in the Fayetteville, Fort Liberty area, all across the military highway and to the ends of the earth. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, it's almost time to dive into part four of this sermon series, Hypocrite. But before we do, let's check out these video announcements.
If you've come to know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you've repented of your sins, you've put your trust in Him as Lord, then I encourage you to be baptized once you've believed. So if I've just described you and you haven't been baptized yet, or you go, man, I, I walked away from the faith and I'm back and, and I've got new life in him, I would encourage you, sign up to get baptized. It's a powerful spiritual moment. It's a huge declaration to the world, to your family, to those around you that you are living for Jesus. I just encourage you, get baptized. All right, so September 10th is right around the corner. People can join small groups starting then. My Man of Connection Night is on that same day. So we just want to communicate to people the importance of being part of a small group. So you got that? All right, cool, let's do that. Action. We're not a church with small groups. We're a small groups church. Eh, cut. Not quite. So we are, that is who we are, but we want to communicate the importance behind small groups, like why people should be in small groups with other people, doing life together. So just kind of come from that place, like kind of communicate from your own experience. You, you got that? All right, cool. Let's do that. Here we go again. Action. Mana Church is a big church with small groups, and we have the perfect group for you. Nah, cut, 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 cut. No, 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 no. What, what are we doing? No, no, no. I, I, I need passion. I, I need I need like the love for for people and community. Like we see marriages impacted and changed in small groups. We see people love their kids in a different way in small groups. We see people get closer to God in small groups. People get in the action. We want to see people join the action. I need you to tap into that place. All right. I don't want to waste your time. I don't want you wasting my time. You good? All right. Come from that place. You got it. Here we go. Action. Small groups get connected. You won't regret it. Cut. Oh my gosh, what are you reading? This is not, let's, let's take it from the top. I need a coffee break, let's get some money back. Well, hey, y'all. How we doing, Mana Church? <laughs> All right, you got to wait. You got to save that because we've got to welcome everybody that's joining us along the military highway. Come on. Welcome to Mana Church. Thank you for joining us. My name is Anna Wiggins. I'm the site director at the Executive Place site here in the Fayetteville, Fort Liberty region. It's my privilege to get to lead there. It's such an honor to get to be on this stage, delivering this message, sharing the word with you today. I want to thank our leadership for allowing me the opportunity to do that. Pastor Michael is with us today, and he's the first one that opened the opportunity for me to do that. Thank you so much. Thank you. You know, we live in a world that is disillusioned by hypocrisy. That might not surprise you, because you see it pretty much on display in absolutely every area of our lives, right? It's in every area of society. Think about it. Politics. Yep, we're going to go there. I mean, the hypocrisy of the whole thing. One political party trashes another political party. Why? For doing the very thing they want to do themselves, right? And then when they get elected, what do they do? The very thing that they were screaming about. Then you've got these human interest groups, they're screaming about how people have to be treated. But if you disagree with them, they're going to cancel you. I mean, forget your job. You're done. And then, you know, there's the, those people, we are not going to name names, who rant and rave about people who drive and use their, uh, the pocket computer that they have with them, their cell phones but then they miss that the light turned green because they were on their phone themselves. Hypocrisy. And um, 
You're all familiar with the, the saying, do as I say, not as I do, right? Yeah, that one hits home for parents or for the fun aunt and uncle. Like, whew, okay. You know, the truth is we're all guilty of it in some way. And the church, as much as I'd love to say that you don't find any hypocrisy in the church, we're not immune from it. I mean, we constantly see instance after instance of Christians ranting about a particular sin or a particular type of sin, only to then turn a blind eye to their own sin. I mean, it's everywhere. But this isn't just a sad state of affairs. Now, yes, certainly it does make for some contentious living, some fraught times in history. But the truth is, it's also a massive opportunity to demonstrate a better way. The church was designed to be counterculture. But sometimes, in fact, too frequently, I think the church lives like we're supposed to blend in with society. Like we're supposed to be kind of a culture alongside the word world culture. Maybe a complementary culture. We're just peacefully coexisting. Or maybe we think that, hey, if we hang out in the world culture and we do things the way that they do, we'll gain enough influence that eventually we'll become the dominant culture. But that's not going to work. Why? Because the church is going a different direction. We've got a different location that we're headed toward. We're headed toward the kingdom of God. That's what the church is all about. And we're called to live the principles of the kingdom of God here on earth. With so much hypocrisy, being other than you seem, you know, those times when we profess certain values and then live in a way that contradicts the very values we say we hold so dear. This, this is the church's moment. This is the church's moment to stand for truth. To stand for truth in a clear, non-judgmental, generous, and a kind way. This is what Jesus has been leading his followers to. It's what he's been preaching as he's sharing the Sermon on the Mount. Of course, we've been studying the Sermon on the Mount all year long. And in every moment, Jesus is talking to us to transform our heart because a transformed heart leads to a transformed life. And if we live differently the world around us will see it and may just begin following him and living differently themselves. So far in this particular series, we've talked about living with people who treat us in discourteous ways. We've examined Jesus' injunction to judge not. We've seen him focus us first on our own sin on getting clean and holy and set apart. Why do we need to do that? Because we're called to reconcile others to him. And now Jesus begins to address what to do when people just won't listen to the truth. And he's going to do it by talking about pigs and dogs. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, Jesus, what are you doing? But speaking of dogs, there was a guy that went to a movie theater and he notices that the guy in front of him has brought his dog and it's sitting on the seat next to him. Now, this is an odd scene. He thinks it's unusual, but he likes dogs. So he's like, well, as long as it's not a distraction, I'm not going to say anything about it. It'll be fine. The movie starts and pretty soon there's a funny part. And wouldn't you know it? The dog makes this like low wolfing sound, woof, woof, woof. and it, it almost sounds like he's laughing. <laughs> and the guy is amused because then a little while later, there's a sad part, and it seems like the dog is weeping. So, you know, this continues throughout the entire film, and the man is just sitting there astounded. 
this is incredible. So at the end of the film, he couldn't help himself. He taps the guy on the shoulder and he says, dude, I gotta tell you, I know this is gonna sound really strange, but I just, I think your dog really enjoyed this movie. And the dog's owner said, yeah, I know, it is bizarre because he hated the book. <laughs> okay, some of you loved that because you love dogs. And some of you hated it because you're like, oh, another joke. But we're gonna talk about dogs. So I'm gonna take this moment to share with you just a little piece of my life. I want you to meet Elwood, my puppy. Oh, I know. I mean, if we're preaching on dogs, like, why not? So this is the dog I promised my husband from the time we were dating until six years of marriage that we were not going to get. I was not a dog. We, we were not going to have a dog. And then Jesus said, just said to me very clearly one day when I was sitting in the driveway, get your husband a dog. So I said, yes, sir. Okay, what are you going to do? Okay, so you get your husband a dog, but then he needs to take responsibility for him. So um, I sent Elwood and Michael to the groomers one day, and this is what came back. I should not be surprised. My husband is from Alabama. I'm just glad he said, I do and not roll tide. Party in the back. Whew. All right. So right now, some of y'all cannot believe that I would show a picture of my dog in a sermon. That's okay, because now we're going to turn to Matthew chapter 7, where Jesus says, judge not. <laughs> but for real, <laughs> let's go to our text for the day. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 1, Jesus says, judge not that you be not judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. What's Jesus getting at here? Well, don't judge people. What does that judgment mean? So often that judgment is those snap decisions that we make about somebody, those character assessments that we make because of a negative interaction. And we just sum them up so quickly. And sometimes we even credit the Holy Spirit and go, I just had a gut check about that person. No, you had a pride check and your pride was the thing not in check. He said, judge not, because when you judge, you're going to receive judgment. There's a law in the kingdom, the law of reciprocity, what you sow, you will reap. So when we're in a season and we're realizing we've been reaping a whole bunch of judgment, we might need to take a moment to pause and say, Lord, uh, have I been walking in judgment? Because I'm receiving a whole bunch of it. What we need to receive is grace because the world needs us to extend grace, but we cannot extend what we have not first received. We've got to receive the grace of God in our lives, covering our sin before we can extend that to others and bring them into relationship with him. He's going to continue in verse three. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but you do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there is a log in your own? Now, last week, Pastor Jonathan broke this down for us. The speck is what? It is like the size of a piece of sawdust trapped in your eye. The person who has it is very aware that they have it. But I probably can't see it in your eye, especially not if I have a log the size of a two-story building in my own eye, because that's what Jesus is talking about when he says, you've got a log in your face. <laughs> so just think about that picture for a moment. There's somebody standing in front of you who's got a little piece of sawdust in their eye, and you have this giant beam, and you go, oh, let me help you. You're just gonna, you're gonna take out the whole room. It's a comical approach to Jesus telling us that all sin has to be dealt with, all of it. But before we can help someone else deal with their sin, we've gotta first 
deal with our own. It doesn't mean you have to wait until you're perfect. But it does mean you've got to start in prayer with the Lord. God, show me, create in me a clean heart before I go and try to help somebody else create a clean heart. Jesus actually gets really pointed. He said, you hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. He didn't tell you that you're not supposed to help others get out of their sin, but first we've got to address our own. And our verse for today, we're going to turn to verse 6. Jesus says, do not give dogs what is holy. Now, we just need to pause because I know that I've just shown you the cutest puppy in all the world. So when I say dogs, you're thinking about little Elwood. That's not what Jesus is thinking about. He's not thinking about the one that cuddles up next to you and just loves on you. See, in this time, and everybody listening to it would know this, dogs were scavengers. So they're not the ones that you want to invite into your home and you are definitely not letting them on the couch or in your bed. It's not happening. In fact, dogs were considered unclean and anybody that dealt with them would be made unclean as well. So Jesus says, don't give to the dogs what is holy. And then he continues, and do not throw your pearls before pigs. Now remember, pearls are often in the Gospels used to picture the kingdom of God. He says, don't throw your pearls before pigs. Why not? Lest they trample them underfoot and then turn to attack you. So what in the world is Jesus talking about here? Don't give what is holy to the dogs and don't throw your pearls before pigs. Got it. I'm not really encountering a lot of dogs um, that I want to give something holy to and I'm not thinking that I'm going to throw my pearls before pigs. So is he he being literal here or is he using this as an example? And what is it that he's after? Well, first of all, What Jesus is not saying is that people are pigs. So just from the jump, understand, Jesus isn't calling anyone pigs. As we continue on, that's going to be important. And he's not inviting his followers to retreat from inviting others to come into relationship with him. He's not not telling his followers they should retreat from society. In fact, he's going to give his followers a mission. It's his mission to go and share the gospel with the whole world. And Jesus is also, like, you you don't find him anywhere in the Bible telling his followers not to be bold when they declare the truth. Find a page in here where Jesus says, well, if people don't like you, just be really gentle about it and make the Make the presentation just fit what they could maybe take. You know, you don't see him, you don't see him say, water it down. You don't see him say, don't speak the truth. So what is it that Jesus is instructing us to do here? I mean, we know that we're called to go and to teach. We know we're called to go and proclaim the good news of the Lord. We talked about this when we studied Matthew chapter 5, verse 14. He said, you are the light of the world, a city on a hill that cannot be hidden. We're called to let our light shine before men. So what is he saying and how do we apply it to our lives? I think there are three big ideas that he wants us to draw from this verse today. The first is don't judge but do discern. Second, avoid vain arguing. Third, treat the truth as holy. So don't judge, but do discern. Now, thus far, 
Jesus has told us not to judge. We got that part. Judge not lest you be judged. But now, Jesus is inviting us in our interactions with people to observe whether or not they're actually listening. He's inviting us to discern the difference between a person who is actually leaning in, who's actually listening to the truth that we're sharing, and a person who just absolutely won't listen no matter how hard you try. Some people don't want to listen. They just want to fight. And Jesus is asking us to discern that. In fact, it reminds me of Proverbs chapter 23, verse 9. You can turn with me there. Where it says, Do not speak in the hearing of a fool. Why? For he will despise the good sense of your words. You know, we want our words to have impact, not just to make noise. So sometimes you'll be in a conversation with somebody and you have an opportunity to share the gospel. You have an opportunity to share. What does it look like to share the gospel? Sometimes it's in everyday conversations. It's when somebody's sharing something about their life and you go, you know, well, here's how I would approach that. And I'd approach it this way because this is how God says that we should approach it. And when we do, there's a blessing that comes with it. His way is different. And it might not be comfortable always, but it's better. And he is calling us to, to live a, a better way. So maybe when this thing that you're doing isn't working out, you want to try it the Jesus way. But, you know, sometimes people just don't hear. Sometimes they... The moment you begin talking about Jesus, their ears turn off, right? You ever been in a conversation like that? The moment you say, well, you know, I was reading in the Bible. Oh, I don't want to hear about the Bible. I don't want to hear about Jesus. Let's have a different conversation. And you realize, okay, I thought this was my moment, but it doesn't seem like they're open to it. So what do you do? When you think, this is the perfect moment. I've been praying for this moment. I've been praying for this coworker for years, and here's the conversation. But they're not receptive to it. What do you do? The good news is that no one can dispute the impact of your life. Amen. We're always preaching, even when we don't use words. But there is a difference in judging and discerning. Sometimes we judge because we look at the situation and we just don't think somebody is worth the time of day. That's not discernment. <laughs> what you need is to listen to the Holy Spirit in those moments. When you begin to recognize, okay, what's, what's happening here? They're they're getting a little flustered. They're getting a little frustrated. So am I going to respond in frustration and just shut down and go, not today? Or am I going to listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit? And sometimes I just need to change the conversation or stop the conversation or go, you know what? Maybe we should revisit this a little bit later. But all too often, Christians will see that moment and they will push in anyway and just begin to go, but you got to know what the Bible says. We will rise to the level of frustration of the person that we're, we are now not conversing with, but now we're arguing with. Because we think, we just got to tell them the truth. But then I go back to 1 Corinthians 13. What does it say? If I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, I can speak perfectly eloquently. I can so artfully convey the truth that is in here. But then it says, but if I don't have love, what am I? I am just a noisy symbol. I am like a toddler playing the drums. I'm just making a racket that nobody wants to hear, right? It's not gonna make someone's heart be inclined to hear the truth if I just wade into an argument because I want to prove that I'm right. Or maybe I need to prove to myself that I'm willing to stand for righteousness. And I'll take that stand whether the person 
is actually going to receive the truth or not. Jesus is calling us to discern, to test the spirits. In John, 1 John 4, he talks about testing the spirit, using your spirit, not just your mind, not just assessing body language, assessing the time, assessing are they just hungry and need a nap? Am I just hungry and need a nap? Like what's causing this situation to escalate here? Not just using your mind, but using your spirit. Holy Spirit, what are you doing in this moment? What do you want to speak? How do you, how? Because sometimes the truth isn't going to come through our words, but it's going to come in how we interact with that person. Lord, how do you want me in this moment to respond and to share your truth? It may be by being quiet, but we'll get to that in a moment. Because we want to be disciples, right? We want to be followers of Jesus, those who imitate him. That means that we've got to act like him. So I got to think about all of Jesus' interactions with people. And we see him numerous times throughout the Gospels. We see him confront people who are walking in darkness, people who are willingly leading other people into darkness. We see him speak the truth boldly, but you know what we never see him doing? We never see him get into a shouting match. Now, some of you are going, wait a second, Anna. I've read it all. I know that Jesus turned over tables in the temple. And I invite you to do a little bit of research. Why did he turn over tables in the temple? Because the religious leaders of the day were keeping the Gentiles from coming in and worshiping. And he said, my house will be a house of prayer for all nations. So he was driving them out so that he could usher us in. Sometimes we use that verse and some other verses to prove our point because we just want to take a righteous stand. Really what we want to do is take an aggravated stand to be right. Then I think about Luke chapter 4. There's an interesting story where Jesus has just ticked everybody off and they said, not today, like this is, this is not gonna happen. He has got to go. And it says that they've taken him to the edge of the town and what do they wanna do? They wanna throw him off a cliff. And what is Jesus' response? He doesn't say a word. He shuts his mouth, he's silent. And he walks right through the crowd and leaves. It could have been a shouting match and he would have done it right and without sin, unlike me. <laughs> it had been an epic showdown. But he knew that that wasn't the moment and it wasn't going to change their hearts. So what did he do? He just closed his mouth and walked away. And I think there's something for us to learn in this, and that is that we are called to avoid vain arguments. And by that, I mean we're called to avoid going to the comment section and being Bible crusaders there. <laughs> you know, listen, we, if you're on social media, you've probably done this. You, you're in one of two camps, maybe. Uh, there's the camp of you see somebody post something and you know immediately that is not godly and God would not condone that. And so you go, I've got to speak the truth right now. So you go to the comment sections and you leave that message. And then there's the other camp, the camp that I'm in. I go to the comment sections to see what people are going to do when you say that <laughs> and grab the popcorn because I know what's going to happen. It's about to be this, well, the Bible says, and see, I told you, Christians always do that. All you're doing is you say you want to love people, but all you do is run your mouth and judge people. We get back in these, comp these, these wars as if our arguing is going to bring someone, as if our eloquent words or our perfectly positioned verse in the cyber world is gonna argue somebody into the kingdom. There are times to speak truth. There are times to proclaim the truth boldly. But we're not gonna argue anybody into the kingdom. 
It's the Holy Spirit who moves on hearts. He's the one who changes hearts. And so if the conduct of my conversation, if the tone of my conversation doesn't reflect the tone of the gospel, then I am missing the point, not the people who are reading it. He wants to use us to proclaim the truth. We get to preach the good news. But sometimes silence is golden. Just ask any mother. Sometimes we need to allow our actions to speak and we don't need to get involved in a mud throwing contest. Jesus said, don't cast your pearls before pigs. Where do pigs like to hang out? In the mud. So when we cast our pearls before pigs, what happens? When we start arguing with somebody who's only positioned because they want to argue, what happens? You get covered in mud and so do they. But only one of you likes it. And you're proving their point. Because they already think Christians say that they love, but actually they just spew out judgment and hatred. So when we get into these mud slinging contests with people thinking that somehow I'm gonna argue my point enough that you're gonna see the truth and back down, we just both end up covered in mud. Paul speaks directly to this whole idea in 2 Timothy. Chapter 2, verse 23 through 24, when he tells us how we should live, he said, have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies because you know that they breed quarrels. And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone. You ever say something and you know like right before you say it, like the millisecond before you say it, you, you know, I should not say this. This is going to escalate this situation. This is a, this is going to blow up. And then you think, yes, that is right. I should not say this. I'm not going to say this. And then you hear it coming out of your mouth. <laughs> we got to do better. We can't do that on our own. We need to invite the Holy Spirit to guard our words, to stand guard over our mouths because out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks so the truth is when I start spewing out judgment in the name of Jesus I got to reflect on what's inside of my heart because it's not love it's not grace it's not the goodness of God that's coming out when I'm speaking judgment and again, going back to that place, you cannot give what you have not received. And so often when I find myself wading into conversations where I've got an edge about everything and I'm going to be right, where I hear the judgment coming out of my mouth, there's a place in my heart where I need to meet with the Lord. There's a place where I'm feeling probably condemnation over my own actions and I need to receive his grace. There's a place where my pride has welled up and I need to humble myself under the mighty hand of God. He's called us to avoid vain arguments because we're called to live a different way, y'all. He wants to make a difference in the world through us. But if he's going to do that, then we can't live like the world. And we can't argue like the world. We can't share truth the way the world shares truth. But then sometimes I wonder if we revere truth enough. Do we actually believe that these words are holy? Do we live like they're holy? Do I apply them in my own life like they're holy and set apart and different? And do I share them with the world or am I just using them to prove a point? 
Because the good news of the gospel isn't about proving a point. It's about changing our hearts. It's about restoring us into relationship. The ultimate relationship with God. So when we use our words to preach the truth, to speak truth to others, it should also be about restoring relationship. About inviting others into relationship with him. Sometimes they're going to hear it. But sometimes they're not. Sometimes... People are going to argue with you. Sometimes they're going to ridicule you, and sometimes they're just going to reject you altogether. And that's not a surprise. Jesus actually, when he was sending his disciples out in Matthew chapter 10, verses 13 through 16, he's sending them out ahead of him because he's going to go and share the good news of the gospel and all of these. He's going to go preach the kingdom in all of these towns. So he sends his disciples out in advance of him. And he tells them, here's what you need to do. He said, and if the house is worthy, the house being the place where they would stay, because he told them, hey, don't pre-plan and figure out where you're going to stay. When you go, find the person of peace, stay there. If the house is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. What is the peace that they carried with them? The peace of God himself. And if anyone will not receive you or listen to your words, because sometimes they're not going to hear it, sometimes it's not going to matter how eloquent you are or how loving you are. Sometimes people are just not ready to receive the truth. What does he say to do? To shake the dust from your feet when you leave that house or town. Truly, I say to you, it will be more bearable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah than for that town. Everyone, everyone is gonna face judgment. And it is absolutely our job to present the truth to the whole world. But we're not the judges of the world, nor are we the saviors of the world. Sometimes there's when we're sharing, we get so passionate about it because we're emotionally invested. I mean, we've talked about the people who just get into mud throwing contests online. We've talked about politics, but sometimes when you're sharing, you're emotionally invested because this is a child that you love. This is a sibling that you cannot imagine not grabbing hold of the truth. And so you just wanna press into the argument. They've got to hear it. Sometimes we need to let the Holy Spirit be the Holy Spirit. Because when we press into the argument, often what we're doing is we're trying to be their savior. We're convinced if we don't say it right, that they won't get it. But it doesn't have anything to do with you. Present the truth. Speak it boldly. Speak it in love. Speak it with kindness. And let the Holy Spirit do his work. Let him be their savior. Verse 16 says, Behold, I am sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves, so be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. I love that Jesus included this statement. Because sharing the gospel is going to take boldness. The world will oppose you. Jesus never invites us to shy away from the truth. He wants us to stand up and to declare the kingdom. He himself would die for it. The disciples mostly would be martyred for it. The truth is it may cost you everything. It's that important. which is why we still need to be kind. We need to be clear. We need to stand up to speak the truth, but we don't have to fight. We don't have to fight like the world fights because we're called to love differently than the world has ever understood, to model it for them. 
We shouldn't communicate that we seem to hate those Jesus is calling us to love. And it's my prayer that we will be wiser than the world, but as gentle as doves. Let's embody the character of Christ as we interface with those around us. Let's pray. Lord, thank you that you you entrust us with your word. You called us as broken and as messed up as we are, as fallen as we are. You trust us to be carriers of the gospel, the good news to the world around us. Lord, in and of ourselves, we won't do this right. We need you, Lord, to give us clean hands and pure hearts. Lord, may we revere your truth, your word as truth. May we love those around us and in presenting the gospel in our every interaction as we live, may we glorify you. Draw people to yourself. And Lord, if there are places where we know, even as we've been talking tonight, if there are conversations that have come to mind where we know we have handled that conversation inappropriately, where we got riled up when we were trying to share the gospel, if we know we caused offense, not because of the truth of your word, but because of our delivery, Lord, would you grant us humility? enough to go back and apologize. Not apologize for your truth, but apologize for our delivery. Would you open up those doors that have been closed again? May we be people who are reconciled to you and bring others into relationship with you. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to ask you to keep your head bowed for one more moment, for one more prayer. Earlier in this message, I shared that, really we read, that every one of us will face judgment. We will stand before God and give an account for our lives. The only thing that's going to make a difference in that moment is what we did with Jesus. He is the way, the truth, and the life. The only way to a relationship with God is through his son, Jesus Christ. John 3.16 says that for God so loved the world, he gave his only son, so that whoever believed in him could be forgiven, would not perish, but would receive eternal life. God is inviting you into a relationship with him. It requires us to be forgiven of our sins, and that only happens because of Jesus Christ. If you are here today and you have not placed your faith in Jesus Christ. You know that you've been trying to measure up on your own. You've been trying to be good enough. But you want to surrender your life to Jesus, to stop trying to earn your way to heaven and to trust Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. If you're here today, I'd love to pray with you. I or your site pastor would love to pray with you. Before we do that, I want to ask if you'll take a moment and if you'll raise your hand. Everyone here has got their eyes closed. We've got a couple leaders who are looking around because if that's you, we want to help you walk in this journey with Jesus. So if that's you and you say, I need to place my faith in Jesus Christ tonight, would you raise your hand? Maybe you're watching right here in this man or online experience, whether it's on a smartphone, maybe it's on a laptop, maybe it's, it's on YouTube, and you identify with those in the room who said, Hey, I I know I need a savior. Those who raise their hand. I want to lead you in a prayer of faith right now. All you got to do is repeat after me. So if that's you, just simply repeat after me. Say, Jesus, I'm a sinner. I've sinned against you. I'm sorry. I repent. Come into my life. Change me. Make me new. Be the Lord and savior over my life. And today I follow you. In Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Well, look, if that's you and you prayed that prayer, we're so excited. We're celebrating with you. The angels in heaven are celebrating. But look, you're not meant to walk this journey of following Jesus 
alone. This is what I want you to do. If you prayed that prayer for the first time, if that's you, text the name Jesus to the number that you see on the screen. You can pause this right now if you need to, but text Jesus to the number that you see on your screen. Once you text, you will receive a prompt and just simply follow those instructions. This is a very exciting moment in your life and we at Mana Church would love to come alongside you and assist you as you begin your personal journey with Jesus. Mana Church, thank you again for joining us today online. If you would like prayer for any area of your life, all you have to do is text the word prayer to the number that you see on your screen. We have a team that's ready and waiting to connect with you and see how we can pray for you in any area of your life. God bless you, Mana Church. And guess what? We'll see you next week right here. Same time, same place. Show. Sure.